Hello everyone. My name is Alfred Mansour. I'm a uh, pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeon and uh, sports medicine surgeon at uh, UT Orthopedics and Children's Memorial Hermann. I appreciate you uh, signing in to uh, view a webinar today. Uh, we're going to be discussing hip injuries in adolescent and young adults. Uh, I have a PowerPoint uh, prepared and hopefully we'll be able to go through some uh, information for you to give you some insight on uh, various injuries, uh, reasons to be concerned or not concerned about your uh, child or, or you if you're the young adult out there uh, in the audience. And uh, we'll hopefully save some time for some uh, questions um, that you can type in and submit and we'll uh, save those. You can enter them at any time, but we'll save those uh, for the end. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to go through them. All right, so again, my talk is on uh, hip injuries in the adolescent and young adult. What we're going to do today, we talk about uh, hip pain. It's, it's, it, uh, it's kind of a black box and can, be, uh, can mean a lot of different things to different uh, people depending on uh, the specifics about it. We're going to discuss some of the causes and, and exam findings. Again, this is, there is an educational component. I know a lot of you out there are very informed um, about uh, hip issues. You may be dealing with them yourselves or have a child or loved one that is having some uh, hip-related issues. Uh, you may be struggling with treatment uh, or mid-treatment or, or uh, have actually had something done and, and just uh, want to explore more. So hopefully we can um, provide you with that information today or at least uh, a primer for you um, to take home. So we talk about hip pain. I mean, the, the hip itself, uh, when we talk about it, and I, I use the word hip, I'm typically talking about inside the hip joint, but it's really a multi-layer um, anatomical structure, and this is an MRI uh, of the hip region and so you can see we start at the skin goes down to the muscle goes down further to the joint capsule and then into the hip bones and the cartilage themselves so it's a multi-layer area and as an orthopedic surgeon I'm mainly focused on the hip area from an orthopedic standpoint but it really can have some overlap um, from a neurologic cause um, a GYN or gynecologic issues can cause quote hip pain uh, stomach issues gastrointestinal problems and even uh, vascular or blood vessels. So it's fairly complex and uh, trying to hone in on the exact causes is, is uh, certainly something we're passionate about, but it can also cause frustration and delays in care um, just because of its complexity. Uh, this is a great uh, image that I have from, a, from um, some of our mentors in the hip world. If we think of hip disease, and, and uh, there's a lot of gray area, but there's a central zone and we call that hip homeostasis. So the hip's in its happy place. And uh, there's not one specific area that, that causes the hip to be abnormal or normal um, when you look at x-rays or even MRIs. So you can find things that, quote, would be abnormal, but the hip has no pain. And the reason that is is the hip, th there is some variability. Um, and so that green zone in the middle, if you will, is kind of the happy um, place for the hip uh, from a clinical standpoint, meaning no pain and good function. But there are other factors that act uh, on the hip that can cause it to go out of that zone into hip disease. And uh, if you look at those factors, I have several listed age, activity level, um, some of the underlying biology around the hip, a new injury, some, some looseness of the joints, uh, and then some of the underlying bony abnormalities that we will talk about today. And then our goals really are, are treatment and not just surgical, but non-surgical and, and uh, treatment strategy to basically push you back into that green zone. And it doesn't mean the anatomy has to be normal appearing. It just means that you have to be functionally doing well. And so we'll try to dive into that a little bit today. But I think if you keep that in mind, it helps you understand why sometimes you may say, well, the doctor told me my hip uh, x-rays are abnormal, but I'm not having any pain. Well, you may be in that green zone, but uh, uh, on the borderline. And so we have some strategies to help you uh, manage to stay in that, that uh, um, asymptomatic state. So I'm mainly going to focus on the musculoskeletal uh, causes of the hip pain and start inside the hip socket, so deepest part uh, inside the joint. Um, as you may know, have heard uh, kind of some of the buzz terms are the labrum um, or the cartilage. There can also be the ligamentum teres, which is what helps attach the, the femoral head or the head of the ball deep into the socket. Um, you can have some pain from the capsule being loose. Um, if there are any ballet dancers out there or other... Um, patients that, that need range of motion, it's that fine balance between having enough motion to do the extremes of sports but not having too much that it causes um, pain and symptoms. You can have tightness in the hip. 
or another one of those buzzwords that's out there is uh, FAI or femoroacetabular impingement, and we'll we'll have a couple of slides on that just to just for clarification. You can have loose pieces inside the hip or some um, benign, usually tumors or growths that are inside the hip that can cause pain. Now around the hip area, as many of you may say, uh, well we have hip pain, but it's not from the hip socket. So you can have tendonitis and avulsion injuries, and we'll talk about that. And that's certainly uh, in younger patients can be more common. Um, unfortunately, those are those are more benign entities. You can have snapping hip where the tendons are tight either on the front or on the side of the hip, and that can cause discomfort and sometimes even debilitating pain. You can have muscle tears. You can have irritation of the bone. Um, and then we have another entity called athletic pubalgia or sports hernia um, where you have an imbalance of the muscles uh, that attach to the pelvis, and that can really cause some problems, particularly in our, um, our athletes. And then there's some nerve compression pathologies that I'm not really going to go into today, but there can be some unusual reasons for hip pain that you just have to think about um, when we're, when we're uh, talking to patients. So a lot of times it's, it's really about the history, where the location of the pain is. Um, we talk about a C sign. Basically, if you guys or are, are patients grab your hip on the outside and say it hurts right here, pointing to kind of deep in the socket, um, that tends to be more inside the hip, but it can be in the front, the back, or the side, um, and just try to narrow that down. I think some key things for me and for patients, when, when, do I, when am I concerned? Well, if you or your, your loved one or child starts having limitations, so if they get sore but they're playing through it, it's a little bit achy, that's less concerning, but if they're really not able to do the things that they enjoy doing, uh, I think that's more of a red flag. We need to know what causes it and what you try to do to avoid it. I mean, uh, patients are smart and they say, well, it hurt here and I stopped doing, um, I stopped deep squats and now it doesn't hurt. Okay, so um, that obviously is a, is a uh, provoking factor and I think we use that to, to help uh, kind of hone in um, the location of pain. If you have mechanical symptoms, and we say mechanical symptoms, I know that's hard for some people to say, well, I'm not mechanical, I don't understand that. Anything called, you know, like catching or locking or popping, particularly if it causes pain or the symptoms that you're having, um, those are concerning for either tears or snapping or some other things that are certainly real entities uh, that we would want to, to figure out uh, with more information. On exam, typically how you walk, how the hip moves, uh, making sure the reflexes are good, uh, just a general orthopedic exam to make sure that it's not, mainly from our standpoint, to make sure it's not a non-orthopedic reason because that kind of gets out of our expertise and we need to make sure we're able to uh, involve other providers that can that can help you at that point. Um, but wanting to see if, uh, compare it to the other side and just see what provokes the, uh, the symptoms. If it's inside the hip, simply enough, if it hurts when you're moving your hip around or moving your leg, um, or when we flex your hip up towards your chest and then rotate it inward, if that causes pain or particularly the pain that you've been having, um, that can lead us to think it's more from inside the hip. Now we talk about instability. I'm not going to go into that a whole lot, but if you have feelings that it's moving or shifting or, or feel like it wants to move out of socket, uh, we're also looking for that as well, and that could be that it's inside the hip. Now I have to, to, to take an aside here. We talk about things inside the hip, but if, especially for the uh, adolescent patient um, with open growth plates, a major entity, particularly now that we're in with uh, running, track and field sports, even um, sprinting, baseball, uh, the stop and go sports, uh, something called avulsion fractures. And uh, I use the analogy of an Oreo cookie, and I apologize for any uh, uh, foodies out there that, that may be offended by that. Um, but if you think of the bone as the cookie on either side and the growth plate as the uh, cream, the mystery cream, I guess, um, it's, uh, it's the weaker area of that complex. And so if you're pulling on both ends of that cookie, um, then it's going to be weaker in the center. And it's the same thing with the growth plate. If you see on this image, if that comes in clear to you, you see this white line, that's one side of the bone. This other white rim, that's the other side. And this dark area in the center, that's really a growth plate. And so those are weaker parts of the bone. And I just have a, a few of them listed where they all attach with kids. And if you can see this little um, white bone fleck here, that's actually what we call an avulsion fracture. So a lot of times it's pain, soreness for a month or two, and then um, usually sprinting, uh, end of a race, decelerating and felt a pop, um, and that's actually the growth plate pulling apart. Now, most of these are, aren't attached to the growth plates that cause patients to become taller, so it's not that type of growth plate. It's more of the attachment of the muscles so that that bone can grow to its appropriate size. Um, usually, um, we don't have to do anything besides uh, rest, um, anti-inflammatory medicine, and then a gradual return. Uh, rarely do we have to do surgery on them 
especially when it's around the hip. So it's, it can be alarming because all of a sudden patients can't walk and it's certainly um, painful and, uh, and even see some swelling, but usually with an appropriate amount of rest, usually addressing the underlying tightness of the muscle is that, uh, that makes it uh, more, uh, it increases the tension on the, uh, the growth plate. If we can address that through a guided physical therapy program, usually we can get kids back, uh, back running. It may take several months, but uh, fairly successful. Now, if we talk about the labrum, I'm sure many of you out there um, have heard of the labrum, the labral tears. If you uh, have a hip condition, you certainly are aware of this. Um, this is a problem. It's painful, and I say it's painful to the patient and the surgeon um, or therapist because from my standpoint, I use, again, the analogy of uh, the, the labrum is the canary in the mine shaft. And so really the, the whole key of treatment is figuring out the underlying cause. Um, and so if you've had opinions and, and the labrum is torn and that's what uh, they're going after, you really want to make sure that they're, the underlying cause is being addressed because it's uh, similar to the canary. If you just replace the canary in the mine shaft, it'll do okay for a little bit, and then next thing you know, you're trying to replace the canary again. So the whole part of our understanding in the exam and the diagnostic testing is really figuring out those underlying causes. So labral tears can happen in isolation, particularly with repetitive hip flexion or pivoting activities. Some of the more aggressive athletes can have them or if there's a skeletal deformity, so if the bone's abnormal, it can cause injury to the labrum. Usually there's some underlying causes, and probably the most common one is what we call femoroacetabular impingement, or FAI. And really, the, the impingement implies that there's pain. So you can have femoroacetabular morphology, basically where the bones have a little bit of an abnormal structure, um, but that won't necessarily cause pain. And there are plenty of patients out there uh, that, that have abnormalities on their x-rays that don't have any pain. But if you start having pain, it's usually due to this abnormal contact. And we'll show you a picture that makes more sense. And what that can do is cause the labrum to uh, wear out and even the cartilage. Now, there's two main types. We call them CAM and pincer. I have a picture for you uh, here. This is CAM morphology. And if you look here, uh, this is the ball of the hip, and this is the socket. So the socket is normal, but you see this abnormal bump on the front end of it. And so what happens is uh, normally it glides through, as my arrow is doing. But right here, you can see it's an abnormal bump, and it gets stuck and pushes the labrum and damages this underlying cartilage. And that can cause pain. It can also cause arth arthritis and really can lead to a hip replacement if it's painful and, and has not been addressed. Now, that contrasts with pincer impingement, which basically the ball part is normal, but the socket right here is overgrown. And you can see this would be normal, a normal rim here, and the overgrowth is that rim there. And so when the hip flexes in, it's not the ball that's the problem. It's the extra bone around the socket that causes the labrum to be damaged. So they both can cause labral damage, but they're very different entities. And a lot of times we have to address them in different manners. Um, it causes pain, typically, um, in the groin area. So anterior groin pain with sitting, deep flexion, squatting. Um, it can be on the outside or the back of the hip, even if it's extensive. And typically it's activity-related groin pain. And, and patients notice a decrease in motion. So if we see those symptoms or you're, or you're having those, um, that could be triggering to, uh, to this entity. If we look at x-rays, so this is what we call an AP pelvis x-ray. Um, and you can have the, so the ball on this side and the socket is around the, the, uh, uh, around the ball. Um, this space here is the joint space. And if you look, the, the socket is quite round. Uh, this patient presented with left hip pain. And so I'm going to go through this x-ray. I think I have a few lines for you. But we draw the socket, so the posterior wall is this gray line, that's the back part of the socket, okay? And over here you can see the back wall of the socket. And then if we drew the anterior wall, so that's the back wall on the right side, if we draw the anterior wall in blue and the anterior wall in blue on the right side, what we normally want to see is this blue lines always stay toward the center of this purple line. If you look on the left side, the blue line is fine here, and then it crosses around the side. So that's called a crossover sign because it crosses over this purple line right there. And so this shaded area that I'm going to show you there is the pincer deformity. Or if you remember back from the other uh, the, the cartoons that we have, this is the extra bone, if you will, use the word extra, that protrudes out and causes the labrum to be damaged and compressed. And this is a side view of, of what we call the cam lesion. And if you look, this is circular all the way to about this point, and then it loses its, its uh, ferocity and it goes out more of a straight line. I think I have some circles though. So if there's a circle there, we draw a line down the center, 
and we draw a line at about 45 degrees, we want to see this circle continue down to this point and then become straight. All right, but you can see where it becomes straighter way up here. All right, with the red line. And so you can see that difference that's shaded. That's the cam deformity. So if you're trying to flex your hip into the joint with this process, once you get beyond the red or the spherical zone, then this is all a spherical, and that's what's going to be bumping and pushing underneath the hip into the socket, causing cartilage and labral damage. So we use 3D CTs, and I feel like they're a great roadmap. It's not the first to, um, test for patients, but if they're having symptoms that we think they're going to lead to surgery, uh, then I often obtain a CT uh, of the patient's hip. And I think here you guys can see much more clearly um, where the ball is circular here, and you can see this abnormal shaded area in the front. You can see it here a little bit more as you go around. That's where it should be a, a spherical as, uh, still, um, but it loses it. And I've got it outlined in blue. Hopefully it shows up for you um, viewing at home. Now the other entity, and a lot of patients that have hip pain, um, you don't know necessarily um, the cause, but you just know that your hip hurts and it limits you, is something we call hip dysplasia. And uh, you can have it as a child, but what we're seeing is a lot of patients who have really mild um, hip dysplasia, and they can make it into adulthood or young adulthood um, with minimal or no symptoms until their activity levels um, cause the overload in the cartilage. And so what happens is a, a hip dysplasia or a dysplastic hip is a shallow hip. So if you've been told that your hip is shallow, then they're typically referring to that. And what, it ha what happens is there's not enough bone to cover the, the femoral head. And my analogy for that is walking on a, on a beach. Instead of having uh, sandals on, you have stiletto shoes. And so it's your same body weight uh, through that stiletto heel. So it's a lot more force through a smaller area. And you can see um, that that causes more pressure um, when you walk. Same thing, it causes more pressure on the cartilage and the labrum, and it can wear it out and lead to arthritis. So we have images that, uh, that we take several measurements. And so a lot of times if I'm seeing patients, it's kind of a, a, uh, a live measurement uh, a gathering session, a lot of geometry. But uh, basically I'm trying to determine if I think they have enough uh, femoral head uh, coverage by the socket. And that can affect the way we need to treat and tackle these problems uh, with very similar symptoms. And so I think that, again, trying to figure out the underlying cause is really the key um, to successfully treating uh, to hip problems. So this is a hip x-ray uh, that I have. And if you contrast that, I, um, I don't have the comparison up, uh, but if you contrast that to the hip that I showed earlier, there are a couple findings here that are different. And so if you look, this is the ball still. Um, very circular, but if you look at this white line, it's pointed more upward instead of straight out. And if you look at and you look at trying to how much it covers over the head, you can see there's all this space from here to here that doesn't have any bone over it. So when this patient walks, all the pressure is going into their hip, and it's and it's centered over this part of their socket. And so as as they walk over time, thousands and thousands of steps, or if they're a runner. Um, or a, a more athletic patient, uh, this is certainly going to wear out sooner. And uh, if it's untreated, uh, these can lead to an early hip replacement. So it's not without consequence, um, and it's and it's uh, you know it's not uncommon that these patients are told their hips look normal, uh, but these are subtle changes that I think we're really getting a better understanding of, um, and so that we can try to intervene early and hopefully change that natural history of the hip wearing out early. So kind of a treatment uh, philosophy, if you will. Um, more so than specific treatment recommendations is just the understanding that abnormal bones don't equal impingement and pain. So FI, femoral acetabular morphology does not mean femoral acetabular impingement. So if you have the abnormal bony architecture plus impingement symptoms, mainly being pain, then you have FAI. So it really is an abnormal contact in the extremes of motion. And so what we don't want to do is try to increase the flexibility of a patient with FAI because it really is at that end part of motion that they're having pain. So the physical therapy program that I really endorse and I think is helpful is really the core strengthening Pilates-based program because it's not going for the extremes of motion that are going to cause the irritation, but it really builds up the core to support the hip um, through the um, non-painful ranges of motion. A lot of times if we see linemen or other football players uh, some hockey players and other players that go into stance with their knees um, more inward than their feet, uh, we can make some subtle adjustments so that those areas of contact don't, don't uh, 
uh, don't contact anymore, and that can cause a relief in symptoms. We do use steroids to decrease some inflammation, but a lot of times that does not treat the underlying issue. Um, but if someone has a, a episode where they're having increased pain, sometimes it can definitely uh, um, get them through a season or make them feel better uh, to allow them to make those modifications that we talked about. So there's limited evidence of, of how successful we are um, in treating it without surgery, particularly if you have those abnormalities. Um, if their abnormalities are mild and we can get patients to avoid uh, the range of motion, then a lot of times we can have a successful result. But if patients are trying to get back to those same activities that cause pain, it's, it's really difficult um, to, to, uh, to tell you with certainty that a good therapy program and then putting them right back out there will, um, will make those symptoms go away. It's, it's a combination of their activity level and the morphology. And so if we're not changing one of those two, it's hard to get them pain free. Now, sometimes we talk about surgery for these, and certainly in younger patients, I try to exhaust everything um, short of that, but, but a lot of times, you know, with permanent limitations and they're not able to return to their activities, uh, we, we end up at this stage. And really, the goal of a surgical treatment is to evaluate the cartilage, evaluate the labrum, and then to treat them. But what you have to remember is we're treating the underlying sources of impingement or the underlying sources of mechanical overload. We don't want to replace the canary in the mine shaft. We really want to change what's going on um, to prevent this from just being a recurring problem. And so you've probably heard of, if, you, if you've done hip research, um, especially online, there's thousands of websites and, and lots of uh, um, data for, for patients out there for education. There's a lot of different ways to treat this. And so I break it down into surgery um, that's done arthroscopically and surgery that's done open. And so for my philosophy, being doing both in my practice, a lot of times I try to figure out and, and counsel patients on what the most um, successful uh, approach will be. So when we think about arthroscopy, it's stab incisions and it's ambulatory, meaning it's outpatient typically, which is very enticing for patients. And the four R's, in my mind, it can repair, it can reconstruct, it can resect, and it can release. Um, and so if, if your treatment involves those underlying issues, uh, then typically we're able to take care of it arthroscopically. Now, that is in contrast to the open surgery. And so the open surgery has a fifth R that we cannot replicate with arthroscopic surgery. And so that's repair, reconstruct, resect, and release, but we're able to reorient. And so that's through what we call a surgical hip dislocation, where you actually open the hip out of the socket, which is what this picture is uh, showing us over here in a controlled fashion, or if we need to do an osteotomy to change the shape of the bone. And we'll go into that a little bit more. And what I'll tell you, patients ask me, what's the best approach? Well, the best approach is the one that addresses uh, the current areas of pain and then the underlying causes the most effectively. So 10 times out of 10, a well-done open surgery is always better than a mediocre hip arthroscopy. And so, yes, there are some nuances here and there's some, some recovery differences early on, um, but you always want to go for that surgery that can be the most complete and can address all the problems um, for the most successful outcome. When we talk about outcome for, for, for surgery for impingement, 70 to 90% return to sports. And it's a very similar return to sports with the open surgery. And so it really is not the approach. It's about addressing the underlying problems. So again, I just have an example. I think these are a couple case examples. Hopefully I haven't put everybody to sleep. And hopefully you're, you're getting a better understanding of kind of the hip pain, particularly from an orthopedic standpoint. And again, really, it's about defining the underlying problem. So if it's about restoring anatomy, I have an x-ray on the left. Uh, that has a patient, again, this was the same x-ray, and you can see uh, on the left side, this patient presented with impingement. And you can see the abnormality here, the cam lesion there. And if I draw the crossover sign, the posterior wall comes up this way, and then it wraps around in this faint shadow. That's the anterior wall. And I can't remember if I've put markings, but this is a good patient where we're not trying to reorient. We are resecting and restoring anatomy. And so this is the osteochondroplasty. This is the femoral head. Uh, right here, and this is where we've shaved down the neck, and you can see that result here. You can see this better contour. It's somewhat subtle, but if you look, you can see that that is now much more spherical, and what may not come out as well is this overhang here is now gone, and this is the front wall here. Right there, it's more sharp, and it meets up with that back wall, so we've taken out both the cam and the pincer morphology. We increased her motion nearly 30 degrees, and she's had a great outcome so far. This is a more complex case, and so I get some of the more subtle ones 
um, that have seen other opinions, sometimes recommending arthroscopy, sometimes open surgery, and just trying to come out uh, with a with an answer. This was a competitive dancer in her senior year that has had mild hip pain for years, um, but has gotten to the point where she was unable to dance. She's tried therapy, steroid, still having groin pain with activities. Um, she had impingement findings. Basically, when you move her hip around, it was irritable. Uh, but if you look at her x-rays, and again, I have them up for you just for, for your um, understanding, this is a hip where the hip is more shallow than it should be. And you can see, if you look over here, the edge of the socket, should be about out to here. Um, and so she has underlying hip dysplasia. Now, she also has some labral issues, and she had an opinion of this needs a labral repair arthroscopically. Um, and I think that it becomes a slippery slope, and if you get into that, um, and patients can actually do worse if they do a hip arthroscopy um, when the underlying problem is not the labrum. And again, I emphasize figuring out that underlying problem before you undertake the treatment. So if you look, these are the walls that I've drawn here, and you can see the posterior wall is that yellow line, and the anterior wall is a blue one. Tiniest crossover, which for me is, is insignificant, compared to the underlying uh, shallowness of the socket. And if I draw a line here, that just shows you how much of the bone is actually being, uh, how much of the acetabular weight-bearing zone is the, the femoral head is pushing on. Draw other lines. That just helps show you that it's dysplasia. And this is a 3D CT, like I told you we get. Um, and you can just see there's so much femoral head that you can see that's not covered by the socket. This is the front view. All of this is without bone. And the side view, again, you can see from here to there is, is where the labrum sits, and there's no bone. And so this is a socket that, under the right activity levels, um, cannot uh, tolerate the stress that's being placed on it. So an MRI shows a labral tear, and there's an arrow. Um, you can see the labrum is torn, but you can also see some other features. It's a big labrum and a big ligamentum teres that make that suggest that this hip is is trying to come out of the socket, and these structures had to grow larger to help contain it. So my question is, which one best addresses the underlying problem? If we go after the labrum, I feel like we're just attacking the canary and replacing it. Uh, but if we use a combined approach, and so what I like to do is uh, hip arthroscopy to address the labral problem. And then, in her case, a periacetabular osteotomy, where we're actually cutting and reorienting the bone um, to address the bony problem. So we're, we're addressing the five R's where we can reorient the socket. So this is her intraoperative uh, image. And you can see here a really red labrum. This is the labrum, the structure from here to here. You can see it's wearing out early there, but it's very red. And so if you went in here and your sole purpose was hip arthroscopy, you would see this tear, you would trim it up, and you would say, wow, it's pretty red. I wonder what's causing it. I may want to fix it, and you put some anchors and, and repair it here. And then five and six months later, she's still miserable, still not feeling better, wondering what's going on. I've done everything appropriately, when really the underlying cause is the, is the dysplasia. This picture on the right is where I'm pressing down on her labrum with a probe. And you can see the labrum here. It folds in just slightly. But what it does is this area here is concerning. This is where the cartilage is supposed to be stuck down um, to the bone. And now when you push down, the labrum actually helps lift that cartilage up like a bubble or like a wave in the carpet. And this is early failure because the stress level is too high. And this is what you don't want to see um, because if it's not addressed, this cartilage can come undone and it can lead to arthritis even at a young age. So I have a video for you that shows you that as an example. And I'm going to um, pull it up right here. Hopefully it's downloaded for everybody to, to look at. Um, this is uh, me pressing on the labrum. Um, and you can see as I push on the labrum, that area beneath it buckles up or bubbles up. That should not occur. Um, it should be nice and fixed like it is on, the, on this right. And now as I push there, see how at the bottom part it doesn't come up? But if I go back to the bigger part, it pushes away that, that uh, um, cartilage. And so right here, this is that bad area. And we'll see. play the video again one more time um, now that I have some. Let's see if it will work. Um, here, and you can see right there, it lifts up all the way down to here. So this is all cartilage. That should not lift up, this whole area. Um, but it does because there's underlying um, increased stress from dysplasia. Now, the area over here doesn't lift up um, because it's not seeing the force. But this is that front superior anterior zone um, where it really has increased contact. And this is how the hip wears out early. Uh, in, the, in patients that have pain, and their MRI may be totally normal, uh, but this is the underlying problem. 
So this is the result of that 17-year-old dancer. So she had the labrum that was debrided. Um, it, was the under, it wasn't the underlying problem, so there wasn't a whole lot we needed to do to it. But what we needed to do is change the shape of the socket. And so um, this is called a periacetabular osteotomy where we cut the bone around the socket and we turn the bone. And if you remember, the left side and the right side look similar. Now the right side is much more flat. It covers much more of the socket. And you can see this posterior wall here, the anterior wall here, and the screws that are in place. And for her, this was extremely successful. Um, this is four and a half months. It goes on to heal. Her hip on the right side essentially looks normal. And if you see the before and after, you can see it's subtle but, but definite differences. And she actually made her college dance team and was uh, dancing competitively at eight months after surgery. So she had a lot of uh, a willpower and um, certainly setting her hip in a more uh, homeostasis, uh, homeostatic uh, uh, position allowed her to get back to the things that she enjoyed doing. Now we see things that are much more complex, and this is just a, an example um, of a 29-year-old male that had hip pain and catching for four months. Uh, he had a steroid injection, still had limited motion, continued pain, and he has a very complex deformity. And if you look at this, um, the front wall, and I think I drew some lines for you, the back wall is there. The front wall comes way over the front here. That's that blue line, and this entire zone is pincer impingement. So the caveat here is anytime you see the overhang, you have to ask, is this the underlying problem? Um, and in this case, what we don't see, and I'll go back here, is the socket is extremely shallow. So this line goes up, and if we look, this back wall comes way over here and needs to be covering all the way out to the side. And so this is actually normal bone from the normal socket um, that's just been turned into the wrong position through his development. And so if a if you have a, uh, an aggressive arthroscopist that says, okay, you've got pincer impingement because you have this crossover, which is true, it's a relative crossover, and you go in, okay, I'm going to resect all this bone to get rid of the crossover. If you do that, this, this gentleman will be left with no normal socket and will have terrible problems later, likely needing to a hip replacement. And so really addressing the underlying problem here, even though some people may say um, pincer deformity, it really is an abnormality in the way the bone is shaped. And so we have to do a, uh, a, um, an, a, a hip arthroscopy first. Again, we had to repair his labrum, as that's part of the problem, but then we needed to change the underlying issue, and that's where we reoriented his socket. And so it's fairly dramatic. Uh, if you can appreciate here, this big crossover that he had in the front um, was really just this normal socket. And so now that once we've reoriented it, you can see this nice line here, the nice line in the back, and they don't cross over anymore. That's without any bone resection. So all we did was change the position of the socket with the same cuts and essentially have given him as close to a normal hip as we can given his uh, problems. He's back to doing all his activities with no pain and has, has been quite pleased with his right side. So a side view again here. You can see where the socket, this white line, ended right there. He has this big deformity in the front, and now we've changed it so his socket carries much more forward, and we've trimmed down his, his bone here. And so, yes, it's a bigger surgery, but if it's what addresses the underlying problem, um, then it's going to give him um, the highest chance of having a, a good outcome. So the take-home messages from this, really, hip pain can represent many different injuries in and around the hip socket. And so uh, a lot of them can be treated with a good physical therapy program, but there's some underlying deformities um, that you have to look for. You have to figure out the underlying cause and tailor that treatment regimen to get the hip back to homeostasis. So I would say in, in closing, don't just replace the canary, um, and that'll keep you out of trouble. All right, I think we're going to open up uh, the uh, question and answer uh, session. So if you, have, uh, if you have burning questions about things we talked about today or anything else, I can uh, answer for you. If you'll take the time to type those in, and we'll start accumulating them and then uh, and answering them as they come in. Okay, I appreciate the questions. We've got a few uh, filtering in that we'll go through, and uh, feel free to um, continue to type in questions as they, they come to you. I'm happy to answer them for the next uh, 20 minutes or so if needed. Uh, this first question um, states, my daughter is a dancer and has been complaining of hip pain for several weeks. How do I know if she needs a doctor's appointment or if it will go away on its own? I think that's a great question, and uh, you know, I wish I could answer it completely um, with 100% uh, um, certainty, but there are some general trends that, that, that I will say. Um, limping, if there's any limping at all, I think that that's a, that's a concern, at least enough to restrict activities um, to see if it goes away. Now, if, the, if you can localize the pain and, and 
touch it. So if it's up on the hip, on the crest where the belt line is, and that's where there's a painful spot, to me that's less concerning than a deep pain that you can't put your finger on but causes uh, symptoms. Um, if she's not able to do the activities that she wants to do, if it doesn't quickly resolve by the morning, um, then that's another concern. Um, if she's had a recent change in the ability of her activity level, so if she was uh, a full kicker in dance and now she can only go to 90 degrees because it hurts going further than that, um, that's another concern. Also, if you've tried a short course of anti-inflammatory medication and activity modification and that doesn't make it go away, typically uh, there's something uh, more underlying. Um, and from my standpoint, I think it's never wrong to come in, be seen, get a good exam, and uh, it's always a great visit for me to say, guess what, your hip is normal, and this is just overuse. And a lot of dancers come in with overuse. They're either trying a new kick, um, or they've, they've joined another troupe, or they've had a new performance, um, and uh, it just uh, flares up a lot of time. They're hip flexors, um, and just with the appropriate rest or therapy program, we're able to stretch that out. So it's not always concerning, but again, it... it I, I like to, to, I think moms uh, particularly, sorry dads out there, I'm a dad, so I'm, I'm biased. Moms are very in tune to their kids, and so if, if that radar is going out, uh, going up, or that uh, um, that uh, red flag, then I think it's reasonable to, to at least ask yourself, does this need to be to be looked at uh, uh, deeper? So I have another question um, stating, is there an ideal age for a child to undergo hip preservation surgery? Or is it best to treat therapeutically first until he reaches a certain age, assuming it doesn't worsen? So another good question. Um, when, we, when we talk about children and hip preservation surgery, it depends on the severity of the deformity. So if the hip is sliding out of the socket, so if, if it is not deep inside the socket, um, then it's best to get it back into the socket as quickly as is reasonable. It's not an emergency, but certainly want to get that done um, if the child is very young and has more growth of the hip socket, the more you can keep the hip deep into the socket, the more the bones can grow around and help capture it. So a lot of times, earlier surgery can mean less severe surgery or a better chance of having a normal outcome. If the hip is deep in the socket, but it's only subtle uh, that it's abnormal, um, you can wait. And so a lot of times, this, this watershed zone, if you will, is the patient that may be 12 or 13 has hip pain, the socket is a little bit shallow, but they're still growing. Um, I've been moving toward delaying the treatments, uh, but following them very closely to see if they're having more pain. If they're limping, I tend to not wait to make them limp for four or five years till we can get to um, a better age. Because again, the whole goal is, is trying to change the way the hip is functioning before it wears out the socket. In an ideal world, if we knew that the patient had hip pain inside the hip and their socket was going to wear out, the best time to treat the hip is the first moment that it becomes painful because that's when the, the hip starts to break down, but before it has permanent irreversible damage. So I like to get into a hip and correct the uh, abnormality and see that the cartilage looks perfect and see that the labrum is angry but still looks perfect because once we can correct the underlying cause, uh, then a lot of times we can change the course of this hip. Now if, if the hip is going down rapidly and we, we look inside the hip and the cartilage is worn out and the labrum is torn, we can change the bones, um, but we don't have a great way to rebuild the cartilage. And so a lot of times we've decreased the process, but it's too far along to stop it. Um, and so that, that can become frustrating for patients uh, and, and family members. I have another question. Um, my hip clicks on a regular basis. It also gives out from time to time is it more likely that this is caused by an abnormality? So again, it's uh, clicking. We do see painless clicks uh, uh, frequently. Um, from my standpoint, a painless click uh, in and of itself is not something to be concerned about. The giving out uh, would concern me and I would need to get more information. Um, if it gives out and it feels like it's weak, if it gives out because there's painful um, catch or lock, um, any of those symptoms or if there's pain associated with it, uh, that would certainly be more uh, more cause for concern. Um, the clicking in and of itself is, is not uh, as concerning, but when it, you start to have associated symptoms, particularly those that are limiting you, if it's giving out, um, I think that may be worthwhile um, having that evaluated. Another question. These are great questions. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to send these in. Um, I think it makes it much more interactive, and I think that uh, this gives us a good opportunity to dive into some things that maybe I glossed over or didn't uh, didn't think would be as important um, 
um, but are important to the viewers, uh, so thank you. Uh, this question is, my son has snapping hip. Will he have it forever? Uh, it depends on his activity level. It depends how much tightness he has, and um, it depends on how symptomatic he is. So some patients can outgrow it. Um, I'm assuming it's external snapping hip, which would be the, the hip, uh, um, the IT band rubbing on the outside of the socket. That's probably a little bit more common. Um, if, uh, if they're able to stretch out his IT band, in which we can a lot of times in therapy or doing exercises on your own, foam rollers are very common to help with that, um, then the snapping can disappear. If it remains painless, um, he may have it in certain positions. And I and I don't uh, I don't know if that changes. We we don't always see the denominators. I certainly see the kids who have painful snapping hip, um, but I do have patients that have snapping hip, and we do a treatment program either with an injection or a guided physical therapy program, or as they get older, their activities uh, change uh, that are a little bit more accommodating to it, and their hip pain goes away, and then they they uh, they decide not to come back and see me because they they realize they have a painless click at that point. Another great question. Um, says, uh, is a hip issue something my pediatrician is going to be able to identify? So if, if we're talking about baby hip um, issues, which I didn't focus on today, um, anytime I see a newborn that has a questionable hip click or hip problem, I always tell the patients to thank their pediatricians. I think pediatricians are key um, for identifying um, problems in kids uh, with their hips, uh, hip dysplasia, dislocated hips, we could not possibly find them all um, without the help of the pediatricians. And so particularly for the younger hips, when they're in their well baby um, stage, they're going to uh, do their best and certainly try to pick these up. And most of the time, they, they do a fantastic job at doing it. As the kids get older, it does get to be more difficult to pick up some of the hip abnormalities. I think they're, they're uh, you know, if they're, they're talking about screening questions and uh, if they're having hip pain, I think that makes it more um, readily evaluated and usually can be picked up. If it's a painless limp, it just depends on how tuned in your pediatrician is. I mean, a lot of, we get a lot sent over from pediatricians, and I think the, the awareness of hip pathology is increasing, and we certainly are trying to reach out and educate our pediatrician colleagues um, on these entities, and I think that is, uh, that's paying some dividends with patients being picked up earlier. But uh, it's a great question because sometimes patients go in five or six years, uh, they've, they've been seen and, and hasn't been really addressed. It got uh, kind of uh, dismissed as a hip strain or growing, growing, uh, growing pains um, when it is an underlying abnormality. Uh, my, my key to you guys is that uh, if it doesn't make sense to you um, and you're convinced there's some hip issues and it's gone on for a certain amount of time and you don't feel like it's improving with the, with the standard treatments, is to just ask more information, ask informed uh, questions uh, to your pediatrician and then encourage them to, uh, to uh, um, dig deeper or to, to get you set up with someone who uh, deals with them. Okay, a couple other questions. Um, if my child has surgery, are there any permanent restrictions? Uh, I think that's a difficult one to answer specifically, but I would say given the examples that we uh, that I showed you, um, we did some major surgeries on these, uh, these uh, adolescents or young adults in these cases. Um, the uh, hip preservation techniques don't get any, don't get much more extensive than, than I showed you. And, uh, and these uh, patients are able to go back to any and all activity that they feel like they can get to. So there aren't any permanent restrictions because we're not taking out any um, natural bones and uh, replacing it with, with uh, metal bearings, which is one of the biggest differences between hip preservation and hip replacement. Um, hip replacement has come a long way and is a, is a fantastic procedure for patients who have no other alternatives, um, but it is permanently removing you know, the native bone and cartilage and replacing it with metal, plastic, and ceramic parts. And so there are always subtle um, permanent restrictions, and those parts can wear out. And so it's a great solution for the 50-plus um, age group. It's not a great solution for the, for the young patient, the patient that has high activity level or, or, or aspirations. Um, and so we really focus in on these procedures that hopefully um, we can, we can uh, make, make patients better without giving them any permanent restrictions. Now, that being said, if we do a surgery that, uh, and we notice that there is some, some um, damage already to the joint surface, we may guide them to uh, less aggressive um, activities. Um, basically, if there's early uh, tread wear on your tire, just trying to limit some of the miles, so that's not uncommon. Um, but we don't have any permanent restrictions to say you absolutely cannot do um, any particular activities. 
Another question uh, that's come in, what are some other non-surgery options for my child's hip pain? I think there's a multitude of them. A lot of them are, you know, have some research behind them. There's some some great techniques that uh, I can't uh, say are are not effective. I just don't have a lot of research. So I get questions about chiropractic care or alternative medicine. Um, I just don't have a lot of great data on them, and I'm, and so I can't uh, say that they're helpful or not helpful. And I have patients that that think they're incredibly helpful. I think that the core principles are if they can. Um, maximize your strengthening of your core, your muscles that are supporting the hip to make sure the position of your pelvis and your hip stay centered um, so that you're not uh, dynamically causing the bones to bump with each other. Um, if you're able to stretch those areas so they're not tightness uh, that's, abnor that's abnormal, um, whatever type of rehab that you choose that is able to abide to those principles I think has, has great promise. Um, we don't have a lot of great um, biologic uh, treatments to treat cartilage. We have some things that are kind of in investigation or experimental, if you will, and that's more of the stem cells or the, the platelet-rich plasma, and I didn't really go into those just because the data is not there yet. Um, I think there are some some, uh, some promising findings, but it's so uh, um, patient-specific that it'd be difficult to make a, a general uh, statements about it. Okay, well again, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully this was educational and uh, you had a chance to have some questions answered. Uh, we have some more information on our website. It's childrens.memorialherman.org um, and you can find us there. And uh, again, uh, thank you for taking time out of your, your schedules to, uh, to uh, be involved in this uh, webinar.